Good morning and welcome to City Hall. We'll get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Ben Brammer is the pastor at Northwest Baptist Church. He'll lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman Kelly if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please stand? Let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, for this meeting. Thank you for those serving on the City Council. And Father, I pray for an extra dose of your wisdom today. And Father, I pray a prayer of blessing too for their families, for their personal lives. And Father, for everybody in this room, that we would live in the light of eternity today. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Where is Mike McAuliffe? I ran, I lost Mike. Mike, come on up. Let's uh, talk a little bit about this event. Mike uh, runs a number of events for people in Oklahoma City, but uh, none bigger than the Holiday River Parade. And first of all, what type of uh, success did we have this year with our annual uh, holiday boat parade? Uh, thank you, first of all, Mayor and Council, for uh, having us here and doing this. We've done this every year to present the Mayor's Award, which is the grand award for the parade. Uh, it's our eighth year, and, and every year it gets bigger and better. Uh, next year, we'll focus on the 20th anniversary of, of MAPS, the passage of MAPS as part of our theme for the River Parade. Uh, great crowd again. The police estimate about 20,000. So uh, that makes it the largest free family holiday event in the state of Oklahoma. And, of course, we cannot do that, uh, Mayor, without the city of Oklahoma City, the Riverfront Trust Authority, Chesapeake, Bank First, and the Chickasaw Nation are our major sponsors. So uh, just another great event and a lot of support from all your departments in City Hall. What will the date be of next year's race? We, we have stayed on the Friday after uh, Thanksgiving. So uh, that just seems to work well for everybody, and we always get a good turnout, so we'll just keep that date. People want to start working on their boats. Some of these already have, they told me. They're working on next year? <laughs> What's exciting, Mike? Well, there's a couple things exciting about this event. First of all, the fact that it is a free family event. So that's, that's the best part about it. But we get new people in every year, like uh, Mercy Hospitals represented this year. It's the first year they did it, and, and they've, they enjoyed theirs. The YWC, YWCA, who's, I think they want to say a few words when they get their award. Okay. But they had a great time participating this year. So uh, it's just a fun way to start off the holiday season every year. All right. And if people want to get involved, what should they do? Uh, track me down and okay. we'll set them up and uh, we'll try to find them a boat or we'll do, what, we'll do whatever we can. All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, 20,000 out on the river on the day after Thanksgiving. So uh, if you're out there right now um, and you're thinking, well, I've got a boat, get to work. Let's, uh, let's see if we can't get you in the water next year. Mayor, if you, if you like, I'll just, I'll just announce them if you like. Perfect. And we'll just go down and end, it, end up with the grand prize winner. Okay. Will that work right. for you? Yeah, sure. And they can just come up and shake your hand. Most of they have their awards with them, so they, you can congratulate them. Okay. Okay. Let's start out. Of course, these are the, the people who are able to make it today uh, to receive their award. Let's start out with Civic Nonprofit. Second place, the Oklahoma City Rotary Club, represented by their president, Marion Payton. Just come up. Mary, congratulations. The uh, next is individual family, small business, third place, uh, Dubstone Construction. It was also their first year, Mayor, and they, they enjoyed their experience. Uh, individual family, small business, first place, Courtney Kilman. Corporate business first place, Mercy Hospital, represented by Jerry Baumeister. Ba Baumeister. The bow, the stern, I knew I'd get that part right. It was the, the other part I wouldn't get. The uh, Parade Chairman's Award goes to your own Public Works Department, represented by Ryan Payne. 
And, and he also has some elves that help him decorate the boat, Mayor. <laughs> and then our uh, Grand Marshal Award this year went to uh, Terry Townsend family. And then our major award, and it was their first year to participate, and it, it was an experience for me to have them participate because of their excitement level. But uh, our grand prize winner, the Mayor's Award, goes to the uh, YWCA, and I think they'd like to say a few words, Mayor. Well, we want to thank you all for doing the parade. And yes, Mike, our amazing volunteers were so excited, and the excitement has continued forward. You know, the, the parade, if you've not been to it, it's a great opportunity for families. Uh, it's one of those things that you can just go, have fun, hang out. There's not a cost to it, and it really is a fun event for Oklahoma City. So we thank you for coordinating that event and for the city for having that. We are um, excited as the YWCA. We've been in the middle of this capital campaign, and this was one of the things that our volunteers thought, this is so exciting. It's not asking anybody for money. It's just getting out there having fun. And they just rose to the challenge, and it was very exciting. So thank you very much. You gotta ring the bell at least once. Yeah. You can ring the bell. Yay! <laughs> thank you, Mayor. It was a heavy award. Mike, thanks you for all your work. Congratulations to all the winners. Thanks, Walt. A successful boat parade starts with there were no boats that casualties. None of them went down in the river this year. Well, at least we weren't breaking ice this year. You know, they, <laughs> yeah, we had the right. one year where we I actually had to break that. the ice on the river to have it, and, and really it turned out to be one of our most successful nights. But uh, it's always a fun event, and uh, it's just a lot of neat things. There's a lot of corporate boats that's put a lot of time and effort into it. And they're really unique to watch. But some of the people that have the most fun are the families that just come out and decorate their pontoon boat and get out on a river and it is you know, a, have a good a holiday. It's a very unique night. event. And uh, 20,000 people, that kind of says it all. It's a fun holiday event, and it's free. All right, on the council agenda, we're on item 3A. I'll ask for a motion on the appointment of Craig Knudsen to the Port Authority. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. And item 4 is the journal. Item 4A is to receive the Journal of Council Proceedings for January 29th. And item 4B is to approve the general of, of council proceedings for January 22nd. All right. Any comments or questions on the journal? Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 5 is request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, several this morning. Uh, starting on the consent docket on page 9, item 6AB, that's a comp case. And we ask that that be stricken and that needs to be corrected and will be brought back uh, next week or the week after. So that's item 6AB needs to be stricken. Then moving to page 10, under items for individual consideration, item 8A, PUD 1476, it's an award aid. The applicant has requested that this item be deferred until March 5th. So that's one month. And again, that's item 8A, PUD 1476, uh, that'll be deferred until March 5th. And then moving on to page 12, under uh, unsecured items, item 8E1, item F618, Southwest 10th Street. We ask that that be stricken. We need to re-notify. Item H312, Southeast 22nd Street. Uh, we need to strike that to, to re-notify. Uh, item 8F1, item B1800, North Bryant. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And item G2820, Northwest 16th Street. We ask that that be stricken. Again, the owner has secured. That's Any other requests for uncontested continuances? Well, let's recess the council meeting convened as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. Looks like there are nine items. And, Mayor, on that, item E is a companion item to the workers' comp case I mentioned earlier, so that needs to be stricken again. That's item E, the comp case. Uh, 
and we'll bring that back in the next week or two. All right. Comments or questions then on the MFA? Your Honor, uh, yes. I have a question on item A, which is a request for proposals for an a, a employee health center. And there's a comment in there that I, I just don't, don't agree with and don't understand it really, is uh, we can reduce health care expenses if the services offered can be provided at a substantial lower cost than the services obtained through the employer's health insurance plan. Why would we assume there will be a substantially lower cost to do that? We don't know if we're going to get substantially lower costs. That's what the, we'll, we'll find out when we get the proposals in. But that's something we're looking for. Okay, so the cost is going to be one of the criteria. Because it was sort of uh, subjective multiple, multiple on criteria. criteria. So there wasn't any specific criteria we were shooting for. Uh, do we have return on investment number in mind? I know they, they quoted a couple in here that were extraordinarily high, I thought. Yeah, uh, it, it's kind of all over the, the place. But, but there have been uh, reported uh, areas of, of, of savings. Um, there, there's uh, tangible benefits of this and intangible benefits of this. And we're hoping to be able to, to uh, come back and, and show some tangible savings. But we do believe that there will be intangible benefits also. Convenience to the employees, having them away from the workplace, uh, less time, uh, more convenient care means that they're more likely to use it before their, their, their uh, illness gets worse. Uh, those are intangible benefits. And then we also think there's, there's tangible dollar amounts. That we'll and the other provide. cities you've talked to have recognized significant improvements in these intangible benefit areas? Yes, but most of them have tangible benefits that have shown also. Well, I'll be anxious to see what those benefits are. I don't believe in this concept at all. I think it's been oversold and, and over, uh, underproductive. So, thank you. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, Skip, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> We presently have a, a, a program, do we presently have the program for our employees which they have a reduced uh, rate at some of the uh, fitness facilities? Yes. Do we know what the use of, I mean, do we have any benchmark numbers that shows the actual use and? Uh, I don't have that today, but I, we can, that, that's available and I can, get, I can get that to you, Councilman. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, I had one other question on uh, right. MFA D.2. Okay. Uh, it's a, a workers' comp claim right. uh, uh, that um, uh, was a, one that we had uh, looked at. Uh, do we know that this indeed was work-related because it was a, one of these claims that was uh, supposedly associated with work, but the lady was retired, and it was a year since she'd had any symptoms? Uh, did we make a special investigation to make sure this was work-related? I, I can't answer that for you this morning, Councilman, but, but, but we There's no hurry. I just was curious. It, it seemed like it was one of those cases that we might investigate pretty thoroughly because it's uh, a little bit vague. It's kind of a... Larry? Yeah, a question, uh, City Manager. Going out for bid on this uh, health idea, is, it the, is there any... Uh, opportunity to include retirees on that, or will this just be for active employees? Diana Barry is here this morning. Good morning, Mayor and Council. It's our intent to open it to uh, employees and their dependents first and look at expanding the coverage to retirees in the future. Any other comments or questions on the MFA? Your Honor, uh, yep. on item A, G. Mm -hmm. MFA, I mean, MFA item G, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, this was one where the uh, city of Oklahoma City denied the claim and then we settled it. Um, how come we didn't go to trial on this? Again, I don't know the specifics. I mean, I, I, we'll get back on, on, on that one too, sir. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Ready to vote the MFA? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Adjourn the OCMFA, convened as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. There are seven items. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions on the PPA? Mayor, I had a couple, if you don't mind. Uh -huh. um, and I think both of these carry over to um, the consent docket. But um, item D is a, uh, award, a contract award for the um, covered outside arena out at the fairgrounds. And I was just delighted to see that the bid came in at Two million four. Our engineers' estimate was 
I think, 4 million one or so. Um, so that was a really pleasant surprise to see. I, I know they're anxious to get started on this project, and, and having a covered facility will be a terrific addition to the fairgrounds, but I was very happy to see that number. Um, and then moving on to item E, I see uh, Robbie Kinzel is here. Um, but I wanted to just recognize that this is a call for artists for our construction project at the Lincoln Park Golf Course. And Robbie, I don't know whether you might come up and just explain um, to those that might be watching and might be interested how they answer this call and in what form um, the art might take. Thank you, good morning. Robbie Kins, I'm the liaison for Arts and Cultural Affairs for the city since July 1st. And this is a two-stage competition. We will invite artists to submit their credentials to be considered, and the, the selection jury will look at those and shortlist that to three. And those okay. three artists will be invited to participate in the second stage. Part of, part of accepting that invitation is the jury statement for what they're looking for, which will be a relationship to golf, and we'll craft that before we leave that selection jury meeting. And then the artists must uh, play a round of golf with the head golf pro, Steve Carson. They must know the course well and understand how to play the game of golf. And then also they'll have a, an architect-led tour of the facility at whatever stage it is at the time of the tour, whether they're clearing ground, whether they're under construction, and they'll see the materials and the plans firsthand and be able to ask any questions. Right, so in order to have their credentials reviewed, how do they make contact? How do they make contact? Mm -hmm. They submit by a deadline to the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs, and they submit a CD. And the CD contains at least 10, six to 10 slides of their current work that they would like. And they need to be kind of um, a good basis for what they're doing currently, and then also values of those work. We want to make sure that the values match what we are hoping to pay for the work. And so they, we will look at those. This is for an interior piece as well. And we're not stating specifically what type of interior piece. It could, it could have a lot of, it could be two-dimensional, it could be three-dimensional, it could hang from the ceiling, hang from the wall, it could be on the floor. But we're, we're going to shortlist that depending on, you know, and make the statement based on what we see and those artists that are qualified. Robbie, will this be the same process that will be used in other maps projects, is it? Yes, as an example? it's the same process that the city has used since the original maps. Yes, for and the ballpark, we, library, and canal, we use the same process at the airport too. Will an artist need to submit a CV every time? Yes. Or will they be on file? So for each yes. application, they'll need to submit it. Right, and the reason that an artist would do that is because each call to artist will be for a different type of project in a different place. And so they will want to read what that call to artists states specifically, whether it's interior, exterior, whether it's lighting. And they'll want to submit work samples that are more like what they think the selection jury is looking for. And will there be a schedule on our city website yes. that would list the times that we expect to issue call to artists? Yes, we will advertise many ways. Uh, OKC.gov forward slash arts is the page for the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs. There is a subscription list. We will immediately mail, if this project is approved, we'll immediately mail out to that. We also issue a media release. And that release goes, um, we hear a lot of coverage over from radio stations, especially public radio, the KOSU, KROU. We will also post this on the Oklahoma Visual Arts Coalition's website, which is a statewide organization, on the Oklahoma Artist Network, which is a new central Oklahoma organized um, group of artists. And we'll also post this nationally on the Americans for the Arts Public Art Network. And then arts commissioners are also very good about posting on Facebook and through their networks. Great. Thank you so much. That's very informative. Uh, Robbie, can I ask you one can question? Can I ask? Yeah, go ahead, Skip. Because uh, I was going to mention this uh, for two reasons. One is to, to thank the, the Golf Commission as it relates to the, uh, <clears throat> the redevelopment of, uh, of the clubhouse. But when I saw and, and listened to your, your explanation, is there any reason why the artists have to be a golfer? I, I, I was just seems like that. Why would we uh, 
have a, a condition that the person had to be a golfer if he's an artist? We don't want them to be a golfer, but we do want them to understand the course, the site, and how to play. Even if they've only played once, one of the biggest criticisms about art once it's in place is the is artists might not be familiar with the environment or what the artist is supposed to do or say or portray. So we want the artist to at least be familiar with that and to have done it once. And there will be some instructions from the selection jury about how this art should relate to golf in some way. Well, I, I mean, I, I can truly appreciate, you know, the artist having a, I mean, otherwise, why would you even, uh, uh, you know, make application if you don't have an understanding as to what the art is supposed to dis, uh, depict? But it just seems like we could cut someone out who is qualified other than the fact that they don't play golf. What if it's a disabled artist that can't play golf but is an awesome artist and understands that if he or she is going to to engage in the project that they have to have a passion for the depiction of, of, of the golf course. And Absolutely. And just, that, guard, that artist too would be able to go through the course with the golf pro and learn about the course itself and the facility. That would be accommodated. Well, <clears throat> I, I, I hope that as we go forward with, with these new projects, that that remains a part of the policy. Because I've been looking for art as it relates to the culture of the African American community in Oklahoma City. And it's been kind of interesting. The one major art piece that I found that was part of the original uh, one of the MAPS projects is down in the Deep Deuce area. And it is so hidden that people who really would try to understand what it's about don't know where it's at. You go on the website, and it's named Incline. It's an African-American man uh, pushing a very, very large ball. It looks like up a hill. And you continue to try to figure, well, what does this mean? And you go to the, the site, and there's a statement from uh, the director of the History Center that talks about the challenges of the African American community when the Deep Deuce was all African American, and that was the challenges that they had every day was trying to push uphill to get to a better level of, of, of life. But it's, it would be great if it was in a place where everyone could see it. And so I, I just think that if this is what we're going to have as far as the, new, the, the, the policy, that that is really, you know, uh, global throughout the, uh, the city as it relates to representation of the different cultures in our city. I understand your concern. And we are working on some solutions for that, too, that I hope to bring back to council at some point in the future. I'm working with Bricktown on that right now and, and downtown Oklahoma City. So is, Casey. is it possible that the... There are a variety of ways to, to do things with geocoding on mapping, um, to use subscription services like the National Park Service does and Museums Without Walls to help people understand what the history of, of work is. And I did run that selection process, so I'm, I'm very familiar with the artist and what he was trying to say with his work. So what was it? Was it what David I said? David Phelps. It was exactly what you saw. It was, he was playing ball with his daughter in the park when he finally figured out what he wanted to do with his work. And, and as he read through the history of Bricktown that was written by Dr. Bob Blackburn, he said, you know, the African-American struggle in this community has, has, it's always like you're pushing a ball up the hill and you can never let up. You can't let up for a moment. You have to always keep pushing. And that was his work. That's why he wanted to do that particular piece. Thank you, Robin. Uh -huh. More comments over here? Um, I, Skip asked my question. It was about dis people with disabilities being disqualified. That's, that was my question. Okay. Robbie, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. 
Any other comments or questions on the PPA? Do we have a motion on this? Okay, we have a motion. Sounds like we're ready to go. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Adjourn the OCPPA. Convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. Just the claims and payroll. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. All right. Are there any individual considerations from the council? We do have a citizen that signed up to speak about item C1 and 2, Valerie Boudreau. Good morning, Valerie. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Council. I just have a quick question Please, on this on. item. We'll need your name and address for the record. Please. Valerie Boudreau, 11108 Northwest 103rd Street. Thank you. Um, on item C1, is this for the Park Department? Where is this money coming from, and what is it allocated for specifically? There were some hidden um, documents related to this on the agenda, six different PDF files. And I'm just, it's a horticulture purchase for plants, irrigation items. I'm just trying to figure out where those. Well, let's find out. Hi, I'm Amy Simpson, the city's purchasing agent. Um, those pricing agreements will actually be used by a variety of departments, parks, the golf courses, could be public works or utilities. Um, there's not a specific funding source. In the hidden files, there was one bid that wasn't awarded, so that's probably what was in the hidden file. Okay. So right. it's not for any specific park? No. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Valerie. Any other comments or questions on the consent docket? All right. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 7 is a concurrence docket. Just one item today. All right. Comments or questions on item 7A? All right, cast your votes. It's passed unanimously. Item 8 begins a series of items that require a separate vote. Item A has been deferred until March 5th. Item 8B is a series of street closures. We'll vote on them individually. The first is in Ward 6. It would close a portion of Northwest 4th Street between Harvey and Hudson. Meg, you okay with this? Yes, I am. This is past the planning department. There were no objections to it, and I would move approval. All right. Comments or questions on this item? Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8B2 is also in Ward 6. It's near Northeast 8th Street and Oklahoma Avenue. Meg? Uh, yes, Mayor. Uh, same situation here. There were no adverse conditions to this one. It was approved by the Planning Department. There were no protests, and so I'd move approval. All right. How about a second? All right. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Your item Honor, 8B3 I, is in Ward 1. Your Honor, I'd like to make a comment, please, on uh, the one that was deferred. Uh, a PUD 1476, that's Ward 7, not Ward 8. It was in Ward 8 in, or at one time, but since the, we re redesigned okay. the boundaries to reflect was. equal population, it's Ward it's 7. right in between. All right, thank you. Item 8, B3 is in Ward 1. Gary? Uh, anybody here to speak on this protest? Um, this is in conjunction with the project on the Baptist Retirement Village out there, and I move the item. Second. All right. Cast your votes on 8B3. It passed unanimously. Item 8B4 is in Ward 7. Skip, you all right with this one? Uh, yes. Okay. You want to make a motion? Do we have a second? Second. Cast your votes then. Passed unanimously. And item 8A5 is in Ward 2. Ed? I move it. No protests. Unanimous planning commission approval. All right. Is there a second? All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8C is a public hearing. Council will recall we discussed the model aircraft issue last week. This is the second time it's been in front of the council. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on this item this week? All right. How about a motion then to move it along? Cast your votes. And that item moves along and the final hearing will be set. Item 8D is also a public hearing. This has to do with the downtown design ordinances and uh, deals with outside sellers and some of the staging areas. Anyone here wishing to speak on item 8D in this public hearing? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8E is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Any comments or questions on the uh, list of dilapidated structures? Is there anyone here hoping to speak on one of these items? All right, cast your votes. 
passed unanimously. Item 8F is a list of unsecured structures. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on any item listed under 8F? All right, we have a motion. How about a second? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8G is a resolution which would approve the preliminary report. This has to do with the race course windscreen as a part of MAPS 3. I know we're going to have a presentation this morning. And Randy Elliott is here to talk to us this morning. Good morning, Rand. Good morning, uh, Mayor and Council. Thanks very much. I'm incredibly excited to be here to talk about this project. Uh, again, it is the windscreen on the south side of the Oklahoma River. And just as a matter of, um, of kind of review, the idea is that um, we have a constant wind, of course, in Oklahoma. It's our blessing and our curse. And so we are at the river really trying to mitigate that wind in an order to be able to make the race course fair uh, for everyone using it. And um, if you'll recall, just a second, Kyle's trying to get us fired up here. What do I do with this? Do I? Oh, there we go. Um, just as a matter of, of reference, it is 40 feet tall total. It's 10 feet up off the ground at the bottom, so it's open to uh, equalize the pressure, and then the screen itself is 30 feet tall. These sections are kind of hard to understand, but uh, these are sections through the river. On the left-hand side, you see the windscreen and the relationship between topography. And um, we do have one spot, oops, we do have one spot where we have what we call a pinch point, and it's a relationship between our property line and where the um, OG&E easement goes through here, and we have to do a little bit of uh, structural alteration to do it. No big deal, it's just a, uh, a variation. Um, we are investigating in, in particular two specific materials. Um, uh, we are on budget for this project. Our budget is 3.3 million, we're at 3.26. And one of the things that we're doing is considering, uh, as you can see on the right-hand corner of this image, a mill-finished aluminum panel. Um, aluminum, by its very nature, does not rust and uh, does not require painting. And one of the things that we are investigating here is this notion about whether it's uh, mill finished aluminum or we do a painted finish. Uh, the discussions are about uh, longevity and those kinds of things. So we have uh, pairs of images. This is the aluminum version. You can see that the white version is a little brighter. We are also investigating this notion of how we would do projections on the screen. Um, Mike uh, Knopp, the executive director of the Boathouse Foundation, would like to be able to do projections on this windscreen to be able to show the race um, simultaneously, if you will, to uh, visitors and those um, spectators watching. So we're investigating those two things. Um, this is a little closer view, and again, you can kind of see the basic intention. We have 10 feet open at the, at the bottom. The screen is 30 feet high for a total of 40. And um, as we had shared with you before, we brought in a, uh, a wind engineer from Colorado to uh, help us work through the dynamics of this. And in essence, we determined finally that by having a design of this nature, what happens is that the southern wind hits this and it generally bounces over the windscreen and it pushes the air, the flow of the air out onto the river. The goal is always for it to be on the other side of the river so that the wind is uh, completely mitigated. However, to make it economically feasible, we chose this particular dimension. By opening the bottom of it, what it does is it equalizes the pressure, and so the uh, amount of ripple or the amount of, uh, of uh, impact on the river itself is equalized, and that's a very important piece of the puzzle. We've had any number of conversations with Mike Knopp about that, and the final decision was that it was better to um, have uniformity than it was to have no wind, uh, which has been uh, part of the discussion. So this, again, just shows the idea. This is the aluminum mill finish. This is the white painted, and we're investigating both of those. This is a, a view looking really to the east. You get a sense of it. The um, property line actually undulates to some degree. We have some topography there, and the windscreen will actually have a little bit of undulation in it, which does not uh, affect uh, the overall performance of it. You can see, again, in aluminum and in white, uh, a little closer detail. It's simply a perforated metal panel. It's 50% open, uh, which is the um, appropriate um, uh, perforation to be able to allow uh, wind control. Again, the aluminum and the white. This is the back side of it, and um, the detail is such that if you'll look on the right-hand side, the majority of the structural members that hold the, um, the screen up are triangular in shape. 
to be able to withstand the wind and, and uh, obviously work structurally. You'll notice that the group uh, kind of on the left, the back member is straight. And this is what we've called the pinch point on the site. We're really tight through this area. We've just brought the back leg of the truss inward. Doesn't affect anything. Doesn't cost more or less than the original. It's just one of the conditions that we're working with. Uh, again, the coloration. Uh, and then these are some studies um, about uh, doing the projections. Um, we are contemplating um, options. This is showing it with no lighting on whatsoever. Um, we know that there will be ambient light um, in the area, and so uh, we are illustrating that particular point. You'll also notice that some of the structure can uh, be seen through the screen, and we're testing uh, ways in which to uh, deal with that, one of which is to actually do a opaque surface in key points uh, to make the projections more clear. Our project is, uh, schedule is 305 days uh, to finish the drawings, do the bidding, and construct the project. The last item is really um, kind of gives you a sense of our journey through this process and the things that we are uh, looking at. Uh, you'll notice that there's several different approaches to uh, painting and surface finish uh, in terms of longevity and maintenance um, and a variety of, of things, including um, screening, bird screening, uh, any um, project like this could have some potential nuisances, and so we're investigating options on how we might uh, go about uh, doing that. So uh, having said that, we are on budget, um, as, we, as I originally stated, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Tell me more about the images that might be projected onto the screen. Uh, Mayor, for example, um, so often what happens in a venue like this is that there will be a simulcast almost. Uh, Mike has thoughts about putting cameras along at key points, and you can actually, as you know, stitch those together. And so you could have an image, especially for rowing when something is 500 meters away or 1,000 meters away. You could actually watch that excitement at the starting line, for example, by having a projection nearby. Mm. And that's the idea, is to use the projections for being able to show that kind of thing. Uh, this year was also the first year for the Dead Center Film Festival to start their programs. Uh, at the river, and that has been discussed as a possibility as well. Is is the projection equipment part of the MAPS 3 budget, or is that just something that they're trying to keep their it options is not. open? Okay. Um, any other questions for Rand? All right, Rand, very exciting project. Thanks it is. Thank you out. so very much. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments or questions on item 8G? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8H, I understand we do not need executive session. That's correct. All right, cast your votes. Item is struck from the agenda. Item 8I, claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under any item listed under 8I? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9 is claims recommended for approval. Two items listed. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on either, either of the items on item 9? All right, cast your votes, and it passed unanimously. Room 10 is items from council. Gary, you want to get us started? All right, Ed? Larry, Pete, first of all, congratulations to both of you. You have uh, announced for re-election and have, did not receive an opponent. Congratulations to both of you on that. Thank you. Uh -huh. David? I, I have a couple of comments. On okay. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank uh, those responsible for uh, re-erecting the Draper statue, which is immediately outside the front door now on your left as you go outside. It's just, it fits perfect. It's, it's just a good, uh, it's a perfect fit for it. I, uh, uh, he, Stanley Draper Sr. and Jr., for that matter, but St Sr. specifically was so important in something that's so near and dear to my heart, and that's the water situation. He, he really was the visionary, or the led the visionaries uh, with regard to the water situation. And um, it's fitting that he faces southeast toward Draper Lake and toward Lake Atoka and the pipeline and all that. I just, I, I really personally appreciate that statue being reinstalled uh, there. Um, Second, I want to compliment the governor yesterday on in the state of uh, 
of the union speech, she made a strong comment with regard to local control uh, for uh, the law concerning tobacco products. And um, I think, and the mayor, that was a great interview you did last night on television. I watched it on Channel 5, and it was a perfect, I thought. And um, the, uh, what we started a year and a half ago using uh, what I consider to be the bully pulpit with regard to uh, uh, doing what we can legally under the current law with regard to uh, trying to uh, uh, reduce the dependency people have on tobacco and in, uh, by uh, going smoke free in our parks and some of that without making it punitive, um, I think has really started an avalanche across the state. We, I think there are now 11 communities that have followed us more or less. Some of them have actually taken a more, um, a stronger role than we took actually. But I think it's uh, rewarding for the, for the city, the largest city in the state, to be out front on something that's as vital to the public health of, of the citizens of Oklahoma. And I, I very much appreciate uh, Governor Fallon's comments yesterday. That's not a simple thing to do. The tobacco lobby is large and well-financed and powerful. And uh, to take them on in the State of the Union uh, or the State of the State address is, uh, I appreciate it personally very much. David. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Saturday, Council, Councilman Shadi and I got to uh, meet with the Heartland Council of Blind, and uh, it was a very interesting, and we uh, gained a lot of uh, a better understanding of some of their concerns, and I just want to thank them. And Councilman Shadi, perhaps if there's anything you wanted to share from the meeting, uh, it was very helpful from my standpoint, and look forward to visiting with them again. Uh, one of the suggestions that they did make to us that uh, at some point in time we might consider for a day uh, coming to work uh, with a some type of impairment, whether it's uh, staying in a wheelchair or being blindfolded, and just experience some of the issues that those that uh, have impairment deal with uh, on a regular basis. And uh, so maybe we can consider doing that at some point in time. Thank you. Meg? David, some people might think we do this meeting blind all the time. <laughs> or with a blindfold on, yeah. and I'm not sure. Um, I really just wanted to thank Chief City uh, and his staff, and Dan Strong as well, for helping me host a, a town meeting here at City Hall last week. We had some neighbors, particularly along the Main Street corridor, that, were, that continue to be concerned about the amount of transient traffic um, running through the neighborhood. and. Um, response times and things that we might be able to do to help and um, it, it was a very very productive meeting and I think um, chief's going to take a hard look at maybe adding a little bit of additional attention over there as we continue to add social services agencies to that corridor um, we probably need to look at adding a beat cop down there and some other things it was a very positive um, productive meeting and I just want to thank him for the overtime hours all right skip I would like to thank my uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Councilwoman Salyer, for scheduling a, a meeting last Tuesday in reference to the Martin Luther King Parade. Uh, the first time, as I was told, that we had ever had a full engagement of everyone that is involved and had a concern as it relates to the Martin Luther parade in Oklahoma City and I think it brings great uh, uh, kudos to to our city uh, and the fact that we had the police department we had the event coordinators we had citizens and everyone that had a interest that was part of the route in downtown at the table to discuss and to work through a working program for the next year's parade was just absolutely amazing. And uh, I, I told uh, Councilman uh, uh, Meg this morning that, you know, I was reading and a big fan of Martin Luther King, and he had a five-point uh, 
you know, agenda as it relates to involving everyone. And, and I think this was clearly, clearly shown on the 29th of, because the people that was in the room, some thought that it was going to be, you know, a antagonistic, uh, you know, form of shouting and, and finger pointing and accusing, but it turned out to be a very working relationship. Everyone was impressed with the dialogue. No one was, I mean, the, the openness of it was, was very clear that the concerns that the downtown businesses had was open and, and, and vented. The concerns that the event coordinators had was open and vented. And the concerns that uh, our police department in reference to the safety and, and was, was also open and vented. And so I think that we have started a, a, a stage of events as it relates to this parade coming up in 2014 that we will continue to have meetings and continue to make sure that everyone that is affected or is a part of the route and the event coordinators will be a true working relationship with the city of Oklahoma City to make it a bigger and better and a more accepting, uh, you know, engagement as it relates to uh, the citizens that are involved. Um, <clears throat> and speaking of, of, of everyone being involved, uh, I usually don't make a whole lot of uh, issues about what I have done, but I have received several calls here in the last week as it relates to the PUD 1469. And it's been very perplexing to me that uh, the references in reference to the, the, the calls seems like that there has been some underhanded uh, initiatives by, uh, by the council and I want to clear something up. The PUD 1469 is the Oklahoma Health Science Center Master Plan. Three, two and a half years ago, I was approached about this issue and said that I needed to see the plan in person before I made any comments about it. The Planning Commissioner, Mr. James Williams, myself, and a representative from the OU Health Science, the Oklahoma Health <coughs> Center, Terry, did a ride around of the proposed area that was part of the master plan. And from that be began a continued dialogue between myself, the Health Sciences uh, Center, the Planning Commission, and citizens in the area. In 2007, the plan for expansion of the uh, Health Sciences Center for a 20 to 25 year plan. And from that point, a number of community meetings was held from 2007 and 2008. And the master plan was, signed, was passed by the Planning Commission on August the 14th of 2008, the master plan. And it was approved by this council on September the 23rd of 2008, the 20, 25 year master plan of the Oklahoma Health Center. From that began an overlay that was an application that was named in by the city of Oklahoma City for an overlay between Lincoln to Lottie, between 4th and 8th Street. The Planning Commission hearings was held on September the 13th, October the 11th, and November the 18th. And yet there has not been a decision by the Planning Commission, and it's been deferred until February the 14th. The question has been, was I directly involved in any discussions in reference to this issue? I was, because it represents an area of citizens that I represent, 
And as a result of that, a meeting was held on July the 14th in which over 100 people were in attendance. And on October the 4th, another meeting was held all in the community. And on November the 5th, another meeting was held. Outside of those meetings, I've had one-on-one, -on -one, I've had two-on-one, -on three-on-one meetings in the community with citizens as it relates to this project. I've met with the representatives of the health center. I've met with the attorneys. I've talked to all of them and expressed my concerns as to what I think they should do in reference to the concerns and the comments that's been made by the citizens here at the Planning Commission, which is all on tape, the comments that was made by the citizens in the community, which one of those meetings I know for a fact was on tape. And not one of those meetings did I have any thing but one thing to say, and that was to explain what eminent domain was, and that this was not a process by the city of Oklahoma City to initiate an eminent domain proceeding. It's the only comment that I've made in that public meeting. And as a result of the comments that I have made to the representatives of the Health Sciences Center, the Oklahoma Health Science Center, and also to their attorney, that this matter need to be revisited and amended to not have such an impact on the citizens in the area. And as a result of that, I've been told that the matter has been withdrawn and will not go forward as it presently stands before the, the Planning Commission. The question of transparency as to whether or not the city has been fair to the citizens, I think we have been over fair in reference to giving the opportunity for everyone in the area to come before the Planning Commission, to have the meetings out in the community, and to do whatever was necessary to give individuals an opportunity to voice their concerns and their considerations as it relates to this project. And so with that, for whatever information has been told, that is the record, and it, it, it's, it's here, it's, it's on tape as it relates to the citizens having an opportunity to vent and express their concerns as it relates to this project. And I think it goes to show that we have a process that we want to engage the community as it relates to concerns that they have when projects are being uh, directed to an area that have an immediate impact on the overall geographical uh, you know, landscape. Thank you, Mayor. You know, I just I want to say thank you to my colleagues on the council and the members of the city staff who took care of a lot of matters in Ward 8 while I was gone for a while. We appreciate that. City Manager reports. Mayor, we've got a couple, we have three presentations this morning. Uh, the first one is, is on CVB and Mike Carrier is here this morning. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Pleasure to be here. We are halfway through our fiscal year, and I want to give you a, a quick update. Um, you have the, the printed report in your packet, but I want to hit a few highlights. Um, November and December are typically slow months for us, and this year was no different uh, in that we have a lot of uh, information out on the streets, a lot of uh, proposals in front of folks, but November and December are typically not decision months. Uh, I can tell you that with uh, in excess of, uh, of 160 uh, tentatives on our files uh, representing some 262,000 room nights, we have had a pretty good January. Uh, and I'll be talking about that in my next report to you after the end of the third quarter. So we have gotten several more decisions, uh, very positive decisions for Oklahoma City. Uh, we've also had a good fall in terms of bringing potential customers to town and showing them Oklahoma City. Uh, one of the things we've known for years is that uh, when you get people here and can actually show them what we have and let them see how Oklahoma City works uh, and the, the people here, their image of Oklahoma City changes dramatically. Uh, we're seeing more of those changes from a variety of other ways now. Uh, 
obviously the, the national press that we get from the thunder and from uh, all of the other things that are going on in Oklahoma City with, with the, the MAPS program overall, Project 180, other programs that we're doing here uh, is translating and carrying forward to other cities, people uh, certainly appreciating what we're doing and taking a new look at it. So we're very positive about that. Our, um, our equine business, uh, obviously fall is the, is the big time for us. We certainly have shows year round, but the fall quarter is when we have uh, some of our largest shows, the, the Morgan Horse Show, the Team Ropers, the Quarter Horse World Championships, the Reigning Horse Futurity, the World Barrel Racing Championships. Um, I know you all get a, a report from Tim on specific activities at the fairgrounds, but as a partner with the fairgrounds in dealing with those shows, supporting them, uh, making sure that they continue to come back, uh, I can tell you that the mood in the barns this year in the fall series was as positive as I've seen it in the time I've been here. And from the anecdotal comments I've heard from the executives of all of the associations, they had a great time. Uh, first and foremost, the fact that all the barns were finished uh, this year when they got back uh, changed everybody's mood. And, and that's something certainly that that Tim and, uh, and his folks uh, should be applauded for is making sure that that work continues and gets finished. I remind you that that work is not a part of MAPS, it's part of the uh, hotel motel tax uh, supported bonds that go in to, to redo those facilities, make them the best in the country and that's literally what we're being told. So a very positive attitude. Uh, the shows were all up, the uh, Futurity set a record for entries, the quarter horse uh, uh, show uh, had a, a new high in, in entries and horses. Uh, these folks are happy. They're looking forward to coming back and I can tell you that the mood among their exhibitors uh, was extremely, extremely positive about Oklahoma City. So uh, we continue to be the envy of uh, a lot of other places around the country, uh, particularly some that are south of the border. And uh, we'll, we'll continue to push that. Um, our hotel tax collections are very positive. We are averaging uh, a little over a million one hundred thousand dollars a month, uh, which is excellent. Uh, as we look around the country um, and and see reports, of course, with the year end, the calendar year end, a lot of reports are coming in from uh, cities around the country. Smith Travel uh, report tells us that we are still one of the top cities in the country, probably number two or three in the entire nation in terms of the percentage of increase of occupancy this past year. Uh, our average daily rate was up significantly. Our uh, revenue per available room was up significantly. The demand in terms of the number of hotel rooms rented was up significantly. Uh, what Smith is also telling us is that nationwide they are expecting more increases in 2013 and in 2014 as they project for the next couple of years. Uh, anecdotal comments from our local hoteliers they are expecting calendar 2013 to be another strong year. What they see already on their books in terms of groups and uh, functions that are coming to the city, uh, as well as the trends that they see in corporate travel, continue to, sh to indicate that we expect this to be another strong year uh, in the hotel industry. And so that's very good for all of us and certainly for the, uh, the, the tax coffers of the city. And we're, we're pleased to be able to, uh, to make a sizable co uh, contribution to the sales tax uh, coffers of Oklahoma City through the, the travel and tourism industry. Uh, we're also seeing some uh, surveys, annual surveys that have been done um, that are very optimistic and we feel very good about. Uh, Convention South, this is one of the first ones to come out. Convention South magazine, uh, which deals with meeting planners nationwide but specializes in terms of meetings that are held uh, in the southern United States and we're included in that group. Um, in their publication, uh, where they're looking at trends for the future, 40% uh, of the meeting planners that they surveyed said that their organizations are investing more money uh, in meetings uh, in the coming year uh, than they invested last year. 80% uh, say that they are that in terms of uh, their meetings that they see the the health of their meetings being at least as good and even better uh, for 2013 than they did in 2012. And 89% say that they expect to have the same or increased attendance at their meetings in 2013 versus what they had in 2012. 
And so these are all very positive things that we're seeing throughout the industry. And uh, to some degree, it's being reflected here in some of the meetings that we're seeing uh, uh, people talk about and, and planning for right now. And we're involved with planning several, or uh, working with several of the groups, planning meetings that are going to be coming here this year. So we look at it as being a very positive sign and there being some good things coming down the road. We appreciate your continued support, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that anyone has today. All right. Questions for Mike? Mike. Yeah, Skip. Hotel. Adventure District. There's, there's several being built, yes. <laughs> walk, walk down the street. There's several under construction. The Adventure District. <laughs> uh, there's, there are several people that are looking and doing due diligence, and uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully someone will be making an announcement soon. But yeah, there... Um, I didn't take a look before I came over at the pipeline, but uh, there are, uh, and the pipeline is a, a publication that Smith Travel puts out about hotel future development. Uh, and it's based on uh, actual franchise hotels that have been bought. Uh, it's not expensive to buy a franchise to say I'm going to put a hotel on this corner. And so they track that. There are, uh, if I remember the number, it's, it's like 25 in the metro area uh, that people are planning for. Now, all of those won't be built. Uh, there are some that are in the northeast part of the city. And so, uh, I, again, I can tell you that there are people out there doing due diligence and taking a serious look at it. And, uh, you know, hopefully there will be announcements coming soon about some, uh, some decisions that, that have been made and, uh, and when progress might begin. But uh, that's, that's kind of the, the state of it right now. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions for Mike? Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Two weeks ago, um, Councilman. Mayor, uh, we have a little urgent matter that is for this evening, and uh, Debbie brought me this note to remind me. So if before we leave, could I just make this announcement to the citizens in this area? Sure. Would you like to do it now? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, for those individuals who reside in the Garden Days, Garden Oaks area, because of the uh, controversy of PUD 1474, there will be a community action, I'm going to say a, com a meeting at 530 at the Community Action Center at 3401 Northeast 16th Street, and a representative from uh, 4A Record Service will be there, and, and I will be there, and I believe someone from the planning uh, Staff will be there to address the issues that they had uh, two weeks ago when this matter was started. All right. Thanks, Kip. Two weeks ago, Council asked for an update on, on the water situation, and, and uh, so Marcia Slaughter is here today. And then last week, Councilman Greenwell asked if we could bring in a climatologist. So a gentleman by the name of Gary McManus is here this morning to address that issue also. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, Debbie, you're going to have to help me with slides. Thank you very much. This morning, I'll be, ex I'll be describing the drought, its impact on our water supplies. We'll be talking about utility approaches to water conservation and reduced water use. I'll be describing our status, and then Gary McManus, our state, climatologist, uh, state associate climatologist, will tell us about the drought. This graph kind of tells it all. It published in mid-January, it says that the drought, drought will persist across our state through April. What's important about that is that we get a lot of rain in the spring. April's a big rain month for us, although May and June are also rain months. And rain's critical to refilling our water supply reservoirs. This map shows you where our water comes from, from Canton Lake in northwestern Oklahoma to Mickey Creek Reservoir in southeastern Oklahoma. We span about 200 miles of water supply locations. That has historically helped Oklahoma City be fairly drought resistant. In our, and what's going on today is we have a statewide drought of longer duration than we have seen probably since the 70s and perhaps, I think Gary will explain to us, uh, perhaps from the 50s. 
we get about 30 percent, pardon me, about 30 percent of our water use actually goes to outdoor seasonal uses. That sounds like a lot, but compared to other utilities, particularly those that have been through droughts, it's actually a small percentage. So what that tells you is as we look at the drought and reducing use, we have a, a less perhaps flexibility than some other cities do. Water utilities look at the state of their lakes in terms of how deep the water is, how much water you've lost from maximum. So what's going on today, you'll notice like half near 17 feet down, we're taking a release from Lake Canton that, will, uh, that is arriving presently. Uh, to help bolster Lake Hefner, it won't be full at the end of, of this take by any means. But our larger lakes, Mickey Creek, Atoka, and Canton, that are the things that refresh our, our offline lakes here in town, Overholster, Draper, and Hefner, are all down around 10 feet. It's not, not a critical mass, but it's something to be paying close attention to at this time. Can we go back to that slide a minute? I you think bet. this is a really important slide, and there's a couple things I want to point out. First of all, nobody knows what an acre foot of water is. That's something that you don't use on a daily basis. An acre foot of, a wa of, of water is just what it says. It's, it's an acre, one foot deep. It's, it's that volume of water. But that isn't anything that makes, you know, people don't have a, a scale to that. It's just, it's just a, a number that's out there. So I want to try to bring that into perspective for you a little bit. Because you take a look at that, there's, there's a lot of thousands of acre feet out there. On an annual basis, Marshall, we use about 125,000 acre feet. Is that That's correct. Yeah, and, and so that puts things in perspective. Well, 125,000, if you take a look at the reservoirs, there's quite a bit of water left out there so that we're not in an imminent situation. We are in a serious situation. We're not in a crisis situation. So we want to differentiate that a little bit. It is not practical to use all the water in every reservoir. And we really don't even know what that percent is of how low we can take it down, but it's probably somewhere in the in the 20 percent is a, is about how much you can use and take down. So there, if it's if it's 100 percent full, you can probably only practically use about 80 percent of that water. And so I wanted to, to highlight that a little bit to, to put things hopefully into scale for you a, a, as to what an acre foot of water is and, and, and how that kind of gives you the status of where we are as we sit here today in in February of 2013. So. All water utilities, major water utilities across the country work with technical and policy organizations on conservation. Many utilities in the country, notably Denver and, and many in northwestern California, have been through huge droughts of epic proportions and provide good information about what works and, and what doesn't work. What our technical organizations and policy organizations tell us is that any very successful conservation program that's looking for a specific goal is, is doing multiple things. It takes more than one kind of activity to reach most customers. The first thing is awareness and education, and that's underway for us. Uh, do you know how to water your grass? Do you, uh, do you, are you aware that it's a drought and you should be conserving? And, and what's your minimum amount of water that you might use or the kinds of things that are presented in an education program? The second is to reduce the time allotted for outdoor water use. That, and that is simply, for example, our odd even outdoor watering is a restriction on the total time available to you for watering. And those can increase in, in uh, control. Finally, enforcement is, is a piece that we don't like, but that is required to, meet, to match and reach some customers. Uh, and rate structures, uh, uh, also the fourth tool, is something that can help us uh, reach some customers, again, it, it is a very personal decision, so it's your individual actions, and it does tend to take these four things in some combination to move us toward use reduction. So the OSU Extension Service is working for us. We'll have information on the web. They'll be teaching. There'll be demonstration projects uh, created that explains Xeriscape and how to use it. And there'll be more media information. Certainly there's been a lot recently about the drought and that will continue. The water release from Canton is on its way uh, and odd even watering, as I mentioned, is also in place. The water began arriving from Lake Canton yesterday. Lake Hefner is up about six tenths of a foot this morning. The, it will take about three weeks for the water to get here. So. It, again, we have several additional actions underway. Today we'll be presenting to the Water Trust some information about billing system 
changes and options that's, that would be available for you if you want to pursue uh, uh, rates that disincentivize outdoor use. We're hiring a, a contractor to re make pipeline repairs rapidly so that we lose the minimum amount of water. Uh, uh, in the past, we've bolstered the line maintenance organization uh, with the pipeline repair contract only in very high uh, demand times. We're going to push the contractor a little bit to help us uh, decrease the total amount of time leaks and breaks are pending. Uh, for, again, for purposes of making certain we can show customers we are conserving on our side of the fence. And then we've met with the regional water utilities to discuss common messages and common approaches to water. We've told our wholesale customers not to expect to be able to use more water than their contract permits. Um, and our wholesale customers account for about 10% of our total water use. So our next steps are to pre prepare for less frequent outdoor watering and, and the enforcement uh, process that comes with that to enhance enforce our ability to enforce should that become a critical to, the, to our success. We're uh, considering, again, rate pricing that we'll present to the trust uh, and, and discuss, I'm sure, uh, before uh, coming to council with concepts for you to consider. And finally, we'll be telling the late after voters that the season likely will be canceled this year. It just does not look good. Uh, spring rains will still come at some level. We, we don't have all the water in the state that the whole state will have uh, through next year by any means. But we, but we are income, we are low in our water le in our water levels, and we'll make certain we're all conscious of this. At that point, ready to answer questions or introduce you to Mr. McManus. I, I, I saw in one of your graphics that. Uh, Lake Hefner was down 17 feet, Canton was down 11 feet. When we complete this draw from Canton, what will the two lake levels look like then? Do you have an estimate on? on Canton Lake will be down 18 or 19 feet. Lake Hefner will be down about seven and a half feet. I think it will be possible to re for some of the boats that are stranded in the bottom of lake, the lake to escape the lake, um, but it, it, we won't be sailing. Maybe. Okay, yeah, Larry? Yeah, uh, Jim or Marsha, uh, as, as we all know, the Oklahoma River, the uh, eastern basin has been drained for construction, and that is scheduled to be filled up in March, I believe. Would you all comment on, on TV to the citizens of what impact that's going to have or not have on Overholzer and Hefner? Sure. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, look, look, there is. We're not taking the water from Sardis and putting that to fill the, 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 the Oklahoma River, River, River lakes. I'm sorry, from, from Canton or Sardis, no, from either one of them. No, we're not taking any water from Sardis. We're not taking any water from Canton that will, that will go in, in, into the Oklahoma River for, rec for our purposes, for rowing and those type of things. So that water will all be put into Lake Overholzer and Lake Hefner. There, even though the, the river it, it, it looks like it's got a lot of water in there, there isn't very much water. And the, 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 the small flows of water that we have down the North Canadian River will fill that basin back up. And if, if we don't have those flows, we'll release waters from either the, the, the May Day Basin or the, or the Western Basin to get water into that Eastern Basin. And it's really, uh, in comparison, a very small volume of water uh, that goes into the Oklahoma River, but we will not be using the water that comes down from Lake Hand. To, to, yeah, to, the, to, the to basins hold about 2,300 acre feet of water, and it all goes in from natural rain runoff from creeks and impervious cover in town. We, uh, Basically, the, 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 the water that's in the river is not tied to the, our water consumption system in any way. That's not correct. Not tied that, to that, it at all. That is correct. It has nothing to do with the two things don't have anything to do with each other. And there's been rumors that we've taken releases from overholster to fill the rivers and those type of things. That has never been done, right. and we don't ever anticipate to do that. You know, uh, Marcia and I, you probably are already doing this, but in addition to outdoor conservation efforts, we can all do a better job of indoor conservation. And, and if we take examples, say, from Europe, where many of the countries uh, have been using these types of uh, methods, some even having to import water, like Spain, from uh, countries like Turkey and other Middle East countries. You know, for example, they uh, 
when a person takes a shower, they don't let the water run continuous. They lather up and rinse, you know, and then turn the water off and, and then rinse up later. Uh, certainly when they shave or brush their teeth, they don't let the water run continuously. So maybe our Office of Sustainability could work with the Water Department in an effort to educate the public as far as additional methods to conserve water. In addition to the outdoor conservations, we could put it a greater amount Happy on to. our yeah. website. And Absolutely. Families. Indoor conservation makes, makes a difference as well. Again, we have been focusing on outdoors, trying to get folks ready for the spring uh, planting season. Marcia, have you received any reports as it relates to wildlife and, and, and fishery uh, as a result of the, the drought? Councilman, um, the, the effect it's, it's having now. We, we know that like Canton's low lake level is going to impact the fishery there. Um, I should tell you that, here's my opinion. It's a drought of such nature that you've noticed on pond farms, pardon me, farm ponds are drying um, this fall, a rare occurrence. Um, other things are happening that we see, and there's a lot of discussion. Gary McManus has just been to talk to the uh, Rangeland uh, Management Association, and we'll have some comments, about, I think, about impacts through our environment. But yes, a drought of the significance lasting this long with this little rain is going to have an impact across the state environmentally. I don't mean to overplay that because we don't know what that is, but you'll see some animals have less food, some fish have less water. Marshes, the uh, odd even day watering system was put in place a week or so ago. Has that shown any measurable difference in water consumption? Uh, not particularly, and I think because <clears throat> this time of year it's not, a, a, it's not a really hard thing to do. Uh, we really should be watering uh, less, and we've had messages out encouraging people to think about it and water less than once a week. Well, I, I know that we aimed at it at the residential segment of your market. But I know the abuses I've seen in some commercial installations on watering, letting it run in the street are significant. So I need to think we had to put all those people together and go to enforce this. Yes, sir. We, uh, we'll be bringing back uh, more information about that. We think that uh, getting to a fixed day of the week, which is a very big change for us, may be helpful for the commercial operations that don't have sprinkler systems that you can set for odd even. Those, those kinds of settings are kind of an, are, are unique, I think, to only a certain number of sprinklers. So uh, anything we can do to help make that process better for them so they know that they're get water, getting water only when they need it and no more frequently than necessary. Be to, I don't want anybody to compensate and think that, oh, gosh, it's my day to water. I'm going to have to. I think that's the message to break, and that's a tough one. One of the things I want to emphasize is, at least from my standpoint, the, the conservation me um, things that have been put in place now are not rationing methods. They're permanent conservation methods. I think we need to change the whole paradigm. I think I've said this before, and you guys are used to me saying things more than once, I'm sure, but uh, we, we, have to, we have to change that paradigm. And so the science is out there that says that you don't need to water your yard every day, then we need to make a rule that, that, that just, that's a conservation method. It's not a rationing method. It's just a common sense, good judgment method. And I think we need to do that. I th we'll probably go further than that. You really don't even need to water your yard every other day to keep a Bermuda grass yard green. So, but they're not rationing. They are not, they're not, and they shouldn't be construed to be rationing. They're, they're long-term, I, I believe they ought to be permanent conservation methods. Uh, we ought to uh, we ought to look at um, making sure that any city that we buy water from doesn't have any way of getting around that. Like the situation happened in, uh, it seemed like I understood that Midwest City decided they wouldn't do that because they could just rely on the wells. Well, we've got to conserve that water also. I mean, all the water. Uh, you know, Oklahoma City went off wells a long time ago. One, they weren't they're not that reliable, and two. There's a lot of people that don't have a choice. And so if you draw down all the water out of the wells, then the people that don't have a choice but to get water out of the wells are going to be without water. So we've got to do it in a, in a, as a conservation method and not as a punitive, uh, oh, it's hot today, it's, we haven't had a rain in a month idea. That, it's got to be the way we do business. And, and I think that's the way the Water Trust is, I hope, is going to look at it from this day forward. From, 
We started that about a year or so ago, a lot of discussion about it, but I think we're in high gear now and we're going to be looking at conservation methods that we uh, I have a question about the about the price about uh, uh, rates. Uh, the sale of water is not um, is not governed like it like fines and things like that, is it? We can we can charge for water a price higher than what it costs. Can we not? Um, there are are things that govern us with our contracts. We're an enterprise system, and so we're not to make money off, off of this. Um, there are standards that, that are uh, imposed out there uh, that we, we put into our, ra our, our rate well, making. But I guess you can still I'm, have higher rates than... And given that, I don't understand how we could use rates to control it if we can't, if we can't charge more than it costs us. But we, we can take a look at... You, you have a, you, if, it, if it's... What's, what's our base rate now, Marsha? Uh, 255 a thousand gallons. 255. So you could, you could lower that to, to 235 and then make the make the higher residential rate to be 315. Okay. And so it may not be a net increase we, revenue the, to us, but it's a, it would impact the... Uh, okay. Well, I think it's, it's reasonable to do it if for, no other, if, if for no other reason than just to curtail the use of water, period. I mean, but it seems to me we ought to be able to find a formula that we could put money in a contingency fund or something that would raise the rates um, because if we just keep selling it for what it costs us, then that's not going to get us where we need it's to be. It's probably not a significant issue to us because of the amount of capital that we're going to have to be doing in the future. Right. And so being able to, to take some of that, that, those dollars in anticipation, build up some capital reserves that will be used for that capital would allow us to issue less debt in the future. So there, there, I don't think that's a major concern. Yes. We're planning to discuss that um, again more this afternoon with the Water Trust as well. I just want to follow up on what Pete said on the rate structure, because in, in reading that, that UIM journal that I showed you this morning, they talk about really measures that really can be quantified. And, and I mean, it sounds simplistic, but basically you, you tax the behavior you want less of and you subsidize the behavior you want more of. And it seems like that in using combinations of like uh, volumetric discounts, if a, if a residence comes in below a certain level, they get a rebate. Um, and for those that use in excess, you increase the rate. Um, it, it seems like across the board, a 10% increase in costs results in a 3 to 4% decrease in short-term usage and 6% long-term usage. Um, That's it. We, we've been running those numbers for this water utility. It, it also seems like you get a substantial decrease in utilization if you can give the customer some kind of instantaneous feedback. So that they they see that changes in their behavior is decrease how much is decreasing their water. I mean, on the order of maybe 15 percent. Have we looked at giving the residential user or the commercial user some kind of instantaneous feedback of what their water utilization is? What? Yes, water utilities can do that only on a limited basis. Some of our larger customers have direct information about their volume of use and do work hard to control the total volume of use to match their contract each month. They, um, that's a good thing. Well, you know that og &E is getting great response out of his smart meter program and that people are very engaged in that. Smart meters don't exactly exist reliably. There will be people who, there are people who do sell them and we have looked at them, are using some, again, data transfer for our very largest customers, but across the board, um, the, the ties aren't there yet to, uh, to automate a meter to tell a customer how much water they're using at a house. There are 100 and, 170,000 houses, and those are the people, one of the, one of the key people we want to reach. We can reach some of our customers, our large irrigation customers are doing that. So did I hear you say that the, the breakdown is 30% outdoor use and 70%? And we think it's about 30% about is discretionary use that we might have an impact on. And, and again, Councilman Greenwell makes good points about uh, other behaviors inside your house as so well. That, I mean, what, what I'm reading, that seems out of line with the national average, which would be more like 55, 45 in right. terms of out. Is there a reason right, right. why there's more indoor use here than the national average? I, um, no, I think it's less outdoor use. And I think uh, overall that tells use. us. Is, it, is there more indoor use here? It, it would there is more indoor use, but the corollary is there's less. Uh, 
there's not, our customers don't use more water than what I would consider an average family. Across the country, we use about 7,000 gallons a month for a typical family customer. But so it seems uh, like a example. focus needs to be on indoor use if we want to make an impact. It also seems like about 25% of your indoor use is from toilet usage. You think that's an accurate number? Could be. Could be. So, so this is just picking up on what David said. I mean, I, I think this is natural for the Office of Sustainability to take this and really try and get educate the public that things like dual flush toilets, which seems simple, but 25% of our water is going to toilet usage. And just doing things like it, that you can flush different amounts at different times would have a tremendous impact. And that's where I think Office of Sustainability could partner and, and hopefully get this message out. So I just want to agree with what David said. I'm happy to help and bring back more information about indoor water fixtures and how they impact us. Plumbing codes have changed a great deal since the mid-80s, and, and those have produced good water savings. I want to, again, make the point. While there's typically a 45-55 split, ours is 70-30 ours is on the good side. That's my, my point. There, we are at a different balance in a good way. Doesn't mean people use too much water in their houses necessarily. Yes, there are some potential savings and we can explore those. Uh, it, it does mean uh, we have a limited ability to capture outdoor use restrictions, but it is, the, it is a large single target. Question, final question. Next year, if this drought continues, next year you're not going to be able to pull the 30,000 acre feet out of Canton. Is that correct? Well, I, mean, I think we have to plan accordingly, and we're doing so. We've analyzed, had a consultant analyze for us refill rates on all of the lakes, focusing on Canton because it's the most dry. Canton recharged pretty much exactly as we expected it to, and uh, lost more water to evaporation than the forecast had had anticipated. So we think Canton's exactly where we expected it to be at this drought level. I believe there'll be 30,000 acre feet to take again next year and possibly more. Uh, but, but it is a very dry condition and we have to behave responsibly. So I just want to clarify that you think that we will be able to continue to take 30,000 acre feet next year and and the yes. year after if the drought continues. Yes, but we believe that two year, we believe can't and should refill completely in two years. Um, and, and again, interested in what's going on in the climatology report input about that as well. Thank you. Well, one point that might ne needs to be made, I think, is that we have the right to, to take water from Canton every year. We, did, we, have, we were in drought last year and didn't take water from Canton. That's so, correct. That's correct. And so we have, not, we have not ignored those needs that people have in western Oklahoma. We could have taken, taken 30,000 feet last year and chose not to. That's well, correct. So and we're not that, oblivious of the fact that, 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 that they, ne they need the water, too. Even though we've got the rights for it, we paid for it, we, 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 have, those acre, we have that storage right, we could take it. But we haven't always done that. We, we've, we've not taken the maximum amount of water from southeastern Oklahoma that we could have taken. Yeah, oh, the, not anywhere close. What? Not anywhere close. Yeah, but so and, and the north. Not, you know, I've, I chafe a little bit under the criticism of some of these legislatures that legislators have just been elected for 30 days and and think that they know how it's all worked for the last 25 years. It hadn't worked that way. We have been very, very conscientious about how we did it, and. We have, we have conservation practices in Oklahoma City that they haven't even thought of. They're not doing conservation practices, but they want to criticize how we do it. I wasn't going to say that, but now that I, <laughs> now that I didn't get an opponent, I say a lot. I may say Sorry. a lot of things. <laughs> also, the North Canadian River, I just can't be silent on this, I apologize. The, the North Canadian River did yield last spring about 45,000 acre feet of water for us, which is um, about what it should in a normal year of 50,000 acre feet in dry weather. So uh, we, we did get water from spring rains. The problem is we haven't had rain really that produced runoff to our lakes since about April. Can I, well, I, I hate to dwell or finish on the negative side of it, but I think enforcement's going to be an issue this year. Uh, it needs to be an issue this year uh, more than others because I, I can't believe that you live in Oklahoma City or have lived here the last couple of years and you don't know the water concerns that we have. And I still see those commercial properties watering that brown dormant grass out there. And, and some mornings they're doing it and all they're doing is creating a skating rink on their yard and on the street both. And I think that 
if we can't get them to understand to get their maintenance people to turn that system off or or be a, do a better job of regulating it uh, we're going to have to to do some enforcement issues on them and i it's uh, i think it's just critical that we do that i know we have a climatologist here from as well all right thanks marcy Okay, thank you. Uh, my name's Gary McManus. I'm the Associate State Climatologist. Um, I just came from another drought talk over at the Cox Convention Center. This is probably about my 75th drought talk in the last couple years. So I've been from Altus to Miami, from Boy City to all the way down to Ida Bell, all across the state over these last couple years. Um, I'm a resident of Oklahoma City, so this impacts me. Uh, I'm sort of the state expert in drought. I provide the input to the U.S. Drought Monitor effort, which is the, from the National Drought Mitigation Center. That's the federal uh, drought uh, tracking system. Um, now, when, uh, you know, I, I say I'm from Oklahoma City, I'm also from northwestern Oklahoma. I've been to Canton Lake many times. I've been getting hammered from my friends and family up in northwest Oklahoma. They're very concerned about what's happening to Canton. I say, I'm in Oklahoma City, so that, you know, I'm, I'm one of these people that's going to be using that water, and we own the rights to that water. But these are the types of problems that we haven't had to deal with in decades here in Oklahoma because we haven't had the drought of this type of magnitude in quite some time. Um, so, you know, the, the, the problem is I can't give you the definitive answers that you're going to be wanting. I can't tell you the drought's going to be ended in a certain period of time. All I can give you is the best available science that we have at our disposal. Um, so now this is my talk from this morning. I'm just going to sort of use it for these purposes if you want to look at your monitor. So if we can start that. Uh, I always start off with a, some pictures from across the state to give folks a, an idea of what they're dealing with. This is from the Panhandle. This was from the beginning of the drought um, back in 2011. We really trace it back to about October 2010 when we had that first La Nina episode, which sort of brings the southern United States drier and warmer than normal weather. But that's a picture right out of the Dust Bowl. That's the dirt on the move in the Panhandle. And that's where I'm from. I'm from the Oklahoma Panhandle. Uh, Buffalo it was almost the Panhandle. Nobody really claims us up there. But um, <laughs> I'm from this area. So drought out there is a little bit different animal. So next slide. Uh, this is Canton Lake. This is, uh, I've been showing this slide for the last two years. Uh, it's at 39% capacity of its conservation pool right now. Uh, and going down, of course, with the water release. I've talked to the Canton folks. They've contacted me quite extensively over the last few months. Um, they inform me that it will be at about 5% of the capacity of the conservation pool, which is the usable water uh, after the water release. I don't know if that's accurate. That's what they told me. Um, but that's a picture of Canton. Um, okay, next slide. This is from up where I'm from, up in Buffalo. It's hardly ever green up that way, so I took this picture. That's my favorite place in the universe. That's the farm pond where I've grown up fishing. Um, that was back in 2009 in times of plenty. So I got a picture of that. It's on my computer. Okay, next slide. That's what's occurring all across the western two-thirds of the state. That's also a stock pond. That's what uh, farmers and ranchers use to, to water their, their stock. And that's why we've had a massive sell-off of cattle. That's the type of situation why we have had $2 billion in damaged agriculture in the state of Oklahoma alone over the last couple of years. And that's not counting what happens with uh, uh, tourism and recreation and other uh, economic damages. Okay, next slide. And that's what we saw uh, last year when I went home for homecoming. So not only is it dry, now we have uh, uh, weeds growing in those ponds out there. So this is a very serious situation for agriculture. Um, and again, that's why uh, folks are selling off their, their cattle herds at a rapid pace. Okay, next slide. Well, we can go by that. That's just a little try to get a little bit of humor in people that aren't really in the mood for humor when they're dealing with this drought. But that's in times. Now, that is from Canadian County just to the west of here. Um, if you take a close look at those uh, leaves on those trees, those aren't leaves. Those are grasshoppers. Um, so that's what we see uh, this last uh, summer with the drought. The grasshoppers on the move looking for feed. Uh, next slide. This is from Okarchi. Again, uh, that's a 15-acre uh, pond, uh, it's completely dry. And if you go to the next slide, you know, that's what happens in the droughts of this type of magnitude. Something we haven't really seen, uh, again, over the last few decades. Maybe the 2005-2006 drought got pretty severe. The 1996 drought got pre pretty severe. Okay, next slide. Okay, let's start with the, just a little bit of background on our current drought. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, just to go through the chronology here, it did begin about October 2010, intensified through the summer of 2011, and now, of course, we here in Oklahoma know that summer 2011 was the hottest summer for any state uh, in history um, right here in Oklahoma. So that June through August period did a lot of damage to our, uh, our soils. And, and we did have some relief beginning in October 2011 through March 2012, basically. So we had six months of relief that was above normal rainfall. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really good, but the problem is uh, we, we had a very warm winter and spring of 2012, and so the plants and the, uh, the water was being used at a more rapid pace than what we're used to during that time period. And then unfortunately, I, I, th I, thought, I really thought that the drought was on its way out completely, uh, but then we had the rainfall deficits begin again in April and May of 2012, and basically it's just continued that way all throughout uh, and through January. We did have a wet January um, but, you know, a wet January is not enough to get you out of drought because it is the driest month of the year. Uh, one of the problems is uh, that May through December period we lost both, uh, and also a little bit into April we lost the bulk of our spring rainy season, and we also lost the secondary rainy season in the fall. So we lost a lot of water there, and that's compounded by the fact that we had that severe drought during 2010-2011. We had six months of the relief, but all throughout that, uh, that other time period it's been drought. Um, and of course, it didn't help that 2012 was our warmest year on record in, in Oklahoma. And again, a wet January, but you know, that's not enough to break the drought. Okay, next slide. And if anybody has any questions during the presentation, feel free to interrupt. And of course, La Nina was the problem as we got started in the drought. Uh, basically, you changed the, the oceanic temperatures down there off the west coast of South America. It changes the air patterns down there. And when it changes the air patterns down there, everything's connected. It changes the air patterns across the globe. What it does for the North American continent, it pushes that jet stream farther to the north. So we get fewer of those storm systems traveling through the jet stream in our area, and they go up to the northern parts of the United States. And on average, during an La Nina, uh, we get uh, warmer and drier conditions. And that's what we've seen over the last couple years. Okay, next slide. And the 2010-11 water year, that's October 1st, 2010 through September 30th, 2011, uh, we were about five to 50% of normal rainfall in the Southern Plains. So that first drought period was a Southern Plains drought. Okay, next slide. And this is what the drought looked like at, it wor at its worst in 2011. Right before that relief began in October, we were about 70% of the state covered by D4 or exceptional drought on the U.S. Drought Monitor. That's the worst such designation. And you can see much of Texas, New Mexico, uh, Louisiana and Kansas was in the same boat. Okay, next slide. And then, of course, the relief. Next slide. Uh, this we had above normal rainfalls from that October 2011 through March 2012. So, right here in the central part of the United States or in the central southern plains where the drought was at its worst, we did get relief. Okay, next slide. And again, in early May, since I'm the one that provides this input, I really thought we were on our way out. You see, most of the state. Um, there in uh, early May, we were w without drought designation, but again, that's when the drought or the drought started going again and intensified because that's when the rainfalls went away. But you can see out in western Oklahoma in the Panhandle and West Texas, they've been in con continuous drought all the way since October 2010. So while we've had relief a time or two, they've been in this type of situation we're in now in Oklahoma City for that entire two-year period now going on three years. Okay, next slide, and of course it intensifies again. Uh, and then May 1st through January 31st, basically the end of last month, uh, most of the country has actually been below normal, and also those folks up in the northern plains have joined in on the type of drought we had last year. So now really, if we look at the next slide, um, well, we can sl skip past that slide. We can look at the current U.S. drought monitor. Uh, you can see not only is the southern plains still in drought uh, of severe magnitude, but it's also spread all the way up through the Great Plains up to the Northern Plains to Canada. So again, this is a drought when you hear climatologists describe it, it's been the worst in some will say 30, some will say 50 years. This is the type of drought that we saw during the 1950s um, and also the 1930s. This is a little bit different drought than what we've seen over the last few decades. And we can look a little bit more at that in a minute. Okay, next slide. Uh, and of course, unfortunately, Oklahoma, as we've gone through the 2010-11 Southern Plains drought and the 2012 Northern Plains drought, 
If you look at who's in the middle of both of those worst of the designations, Oklahoma is unfortunately uh, getting the, the worst of both of those. And that's exactly what happened during the 30s drought, which was a Northern Plains drought, and the 50s drought, which was a Southern Plains drought. Oklahoma was in the middle and we got the worst of both. So um, sort of what's happened the last couple of years. Next slide. Uh, and of course, this is just something for the rangeland folks. We can go by that one. Um, Okay, now we get to the forecasts and outlooks. And again, this is where I said, I can't give you definitive answers. All I can give you is the best available science. And these, when we get into the seasonal type time scales out to several months in advance, the accuracy is not as good as we'd like it to be, uh, but it does give us sort of an indication of what we're seeing. Okay, uh, at least for the next seven days, you've probably seen the TV meteorologist talking about this a lot. We do have a chance for some pretty good rains. We're in a more active pattern. You can see if at least through next Tuesday morning, we have a chance to get, oh, about, you know, a, a tenth to a quarter of an inch across western Oklahoma to maybe two inches or so down in southeastern Oklahoma. And it's very difficult to predict what that's actually going to look like when it's over because it will come in the form of thunderstorms. Predicting where those squall lines set up and, and, and continuously train over the, the same uh, locations over time, it's very difficult. But at least we have a pretty decent chance for some good rains over the next week or so. Okay, next slide. Now, as we get out to the medium term, these are amounts, uh, these are from the Climate Prediction Center for the February 12th through the February 18th period. These are uh, probability maps. So when you see the blue, that's an increased chance of below normal temperatures. When you see the green over on the precipitation side, that's increased odds of above normal precipitation. So at least for the eastern two thirds of the state through that uh, second week out, we do have increased odds of above normal precipitation. Now, above normal in February is not the same as above normal in May. So it is a dry time of the year, uh, but at least we're in the green and not the brown, which we've been in so much. Okay, let's go to the latest, and uh, Marsha already showed this. I don't need to really dwell on this. It's just, uh, you know, this simply says that as we go out through the next three months, what the climatologists have seen when they've looked at the long-term patterns does favor that drought to either persist or intensify over much of the area of the country that is already in drought. A lot of, some of that's based on soil moisture, some of that's based on what the long-term models are showing. Okay, next slide. And here's where it gets a little bit worrisome as we go with the same type of maps from the Climate Prediction Center. These are for the April, May, June time period. So a three month period, this is the primary spring rainy season. You can see we have greatly increased odds of above normal temperatures across Oklahoma. And we also have increased odds of below normal precipitation. Again, this is not written in stone. It's not the mother nature doesn't have the permanent magic marker out just yet saying what's gonna happen. We will see, but this is what the longer, longer term outlook looks like. Um, it does favor warmer and drier, exactly what we've seen for the most part for the last two years. Okay, next slide. Uh, just a brief history drought because, you know, we have been sort of lulled into a, cell, uh, a, a false sense of confidence over the last few decades because of what we've seen as far as drought goes uh, in the state of Oklahoma. So next slide. Uh, you know, we have all these oceanic indices. We have El Nino, La Nina. We have something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Um, and we have something called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. Just a bunch of gobbledygook from climatologists, but we do... Uh, we are able to uh, correlate those types of oceanic patterns to our weather because the oceans have a huge impact on the weather uh, patterns across the globe. What we've seen here is uh, these fluctuating patterns. So when we have the Pacific Decadal Oscillation in negative mode, we get mostly La Niña's. I've already explained that when we get La Niña, it's normally uh, uh, warmer and drier in this part of the country. So you can see from the 50s, basically through 75, we had a period of extended uh, negative PDO when we had mostly La Niña's or mostly drier and warmer weather. Uh, and then through the 80s, we had mostly El Niño's with that positive PDO. So we had an extended period of uh, above normal rainfall uh, and, and pleasant weather. And then of course we had a switch back to the negative PDO and then we have more uh, uh, La Niña's as we get into the 2000s. Now the problem here is is the PDO, if it does correlate to bringing more La Niña's when it's negative, and we're currently just switched over to a negative uh, PDO, it lasts from 10 to about 30 years. So we could be, 
you know, about to come out of this negative PDL and get back to El Nino wet times, or we could have another couple of decades of these mostly La Nina periods. And, and so the droughts of, let's say, the dry periods of the 50s through the 70s might be what we see instead of the wet periods uh, of the 80s through the 2000s. Okay? All right, next slide. Uh, we can go by, uh, this is just another uh, indication of that. Uh, during the 50s through the basically mid 70s, we had lots of La Ninas with that negative PDO, uh, lots of dry weather. It was drought more often than not. Um, and then, of course, through the 80s and 90s and 2000s, we had uh, consistently wet weather with uh, uh, positive PDO and lots of El Ninos. So I know I'm giving you lots of weird acronyms, but that's really how us climatologists talk, unfortunately. Okay, next slide. Um, there's an also another one out there, the Atlantic uh, uh, multi-decadal oscillation. When it's below in the negative, the, the blue area, um, we get wetter times. When it's above in the positive area, we get uh, drier times. Um, and you can see during the 30s and 50s, we were in the positive mode, and we're back in the positive mode. Again, this is a problem because this is another one that lasts for decades. So all the oceanic indicators to us, to climatologists, are pointing towards an extended period of drought susceptibility. That doesn't mean just continuous drought throughout whatever time period these uh, uh, oscillations are acting together, but it does mean possibly more drier times than not. Okay, next slide. Okay, this one's a little bit uh, hard to get your uh, mind wrapped around, but this is the average statewide precipitation averaged over the state from 1895 through 2012 uh, each one of those black dots starting in 1895, that's the statewide average precipitation. The long straight line, that's the long-term average. The wavy line is a five-year moving average, so we can just tell when it's in the brown area uh, underneath that straight line, that's when it was drier than normal. When it's in the green area, that's when it was wetter than normal. And this exemplifies what we've seen in our past. The 19-teens drought, which was very severe. The 1930s drought was the Dust Bowl drought, of course. And then we had the 1950s drought. And then we had the 60s were a dry period, and then a little bit in the 70s. Now, if you remember my previous slides, that 1950 through 1975 period was when we were, had those uh, lots of La Ninas and the negative PDO. So that correlates very well with that period. And then over the last 30 years or so, we've had a very consistent, abnormally wet period in Oklahoma history. And again, that correlates to when that PDO was in the positive mode. Um, but you can look at the last couple of years on that uh, graph the 2011, 2012, we haven't seen that type of two years in a row um, really in the last 30 years and probably since about 1950. Uh, and, and you, know, you can look at the 60s and the 70s, but not two years in a row and not that consistent. So again, we did have short but severe droughts there in the 90s and 2000s. You can see those droughts show up in about 2002, 2005, 2006, but nothing to the magnitude of what we've had the last couple of years in the last 30 to maybe even 50 years. So we are in a sort of a different sort of climate regime now that those oceanic indicators are no longer in our favor. So that's not a prediction, again, of drought over the next 10, 20, 30 years. It's just something that we have to be cognizant of uh, as we think about conservation. Okay, next slide. And to go even farther back, the droughts of our recent past, if you consider the last 100 years or recent past, those are babies compared to some of the droughts we've had here in the Great Plains um, over the last uh, 1,000, 2,000 years. You can see that drought there from about uh, 200 to about 400. So that's a 150-year drought there. Um, you can look at how small it looks for the 1950s drought we had, which was extremely severe. Um, so, you know, it just depends on how the climate sets up and what sort of patterns we get in. But, you know, we think about the 50s drought or the 30s drought being so severe but we've had even worse droughts farther back in our past. Okay, next slide. Another indication of that, uh, recent droughts are just tiny blips in our history compared to some of those we've seen in our past. You can see that one in 1200, that's the one that's thought to have ended the, the civilization of the Anasazi and the cliff dwellers uh, out in the desert southwest, um, and also some of those throughout our history. So the recent droughts are just babies compared to some of the droughts of our past. Not anything to worry about, just something to, to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, uh, just to go through the final points, we will likely be in significant drought as we come into the spring months, simply because we're in our driest time of the year. It's not expected we would get enough rainfall to come completely out of drought in the next month or two. 
Uh, another swing and a miss during spring, and three, a, a complete third year drought becomes much more likely. So we've had two bad springs in a row, um, we've had two bad summers in a row as a result of that. A lot of damage is done in the summer months when we have bad springs because when you get to the summer months and that sun starts to do its work and there's not much soil moisture, the heat increases. And when the heat increases, it absorbs more of that soil, it evaporates more of that soil moisture, it gets hotter, and it becomes a feedback effect. And so a lot of damage is done in the summers in Oklahoma when we're in drought. The ocean patterns, as I mentioned, they are in a favorable position to get uh, more uh, dry times rather than wet times over the next decade or so. And that being said, we might be in a longer period of drought susceptibility. Not a longer period of this drought, like stretching out years, but just a period of, as we look back in history and we get past this, we see a lot more brown than green. And of course, it's what we don't know that's usually most important. So unfortunately, we won't know that until it's after it's over. And uh, uh, you know, I like to always end like this. This current drought in Oklahoma is the only drought that has yet to end in our history. So this drought, just like all the others in our history, will eventually end. We will learn from it, and we will just think back on it in very unpleasant memories. So that's my presentation. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming down. Any, yeah. any questions of any sort? Or? I'm sure there uh, could be a lot. <laughs> Skip, not, then David. not directly to, to the expert, but Take it in consideration of, of uh, this well-defined uh, uh, <clears throat> statement of, of the conditions of our uh, climate. I think we need to be real proactive as it relates to wildfires. We know the experience from several years ago when the fires that was at Northeast and in the south side of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma County, that we probably need to start looking at some proactive educational programs in the communities with our fire department and, 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 and address the issues of, of prevention because uh, this is going to be a major, you know, uh, travesty if we have the same type of fires that we had several years ago. Much of the water in far northeast Oklahoma City a lot of that water that was used to uh, put out those fires was coming from the lakes. They had to resort to, to helicopters in order to, uh, to move water fast enough to get to areas to make sure that people's lives were saved. If the lakes are dry, that water won't be available. And so consequently, you got you know, the dependency on just what you have there in the, in the hydrants in the area. And so I think that, you know, the education of our citizens as to, you know, the brush, the side roads, and uh, maintaining their property as far as cutbacks is, is something that we need to take into serious consideration and not wait until it happens. <clears throat> okay. David? Uh, Gary, do you know of any uh, studies? Uh, to indicate the uh, usefulness of seeding of clouds to uh, encourage rain? Yeah, that, that science is, is sort of out in the fringe. I know there's been a ton of studies done on that. The problem is you can't take a, a cloud and seed it uh, and see what it does, and then you can't go take that cloud back in history and not seed it and see what it does. So it's very difficult. The, 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 the opinions on that are mixed. Um, so. You know, the Water Resources Board has done a study on that. The Climate Survey itself has done a study on that. And I think from what the results we've seen, it's, it's a mixed. Some people, it's just like everything else. Some people swear by it. Some people think it doesn't work. Some people say it increases hail. Some people say it doesn't do anything. So it, it, it's, it's something to fall back on, but it, the, the science is not definitive on that subject. Any studies going on to uh identify ways to modify those ocean patterns, or is that uh, that's That would probably be an engineering feat of unbelievable proportions. And then once you start messing with something like that, of course, how do you get it back to normal? But I don't think that's even under the realm of possibility. Well, I'm not opposed to trying seeding if, it, <laughs> yeah. if there's any kind of chance to, because uh, it's been rough the past couple of years, so thank you. It has been just a couple of years, and you know, that's the thing, putting this drought in perspective, Think about the 50s, it was a six to seven year drought. Think about just the last two years, extend that out another four to five years. 
think of the 1930s drought, which was 11 years in Oklahoma, extend that out another eight to nine years. So again, this drought in itself is in its infancy compared to some in our past. It might end this spring, we don't know, but you know, the odds are that we're gonna be drier than normal uh, over the next few decades, uh, just simply looking at the ocean patterns, which that science itself is not perfect either. We really appreciate you taking the time and thanks you for bet. your work. You bet, my pleasure. It's been very informative. My pleasure. And Christian Vales is here from the Plaza District to give us an update on their activities. Thank you for being patient. Good morning. I am thrilled to be able to highlight the progress of the Plaza District over the last several years. Um, this month actually marks my fifth year with the Plaza District, and I'm really proud of all that our team has been able to accomplish thanks to the city, the community, and our stakeholders. We've really seen an amazing transformation in the district over the last few years. Um, in two, we've been an organization working in the district since 1997. In 2000, it marked the first public investment with the um, 16th Street Streetca Streetscape, a $2.1 million geo bond issue. In 2002, we were a pilot program. In 2007, we became a Main Street program, and we continue our contract with the city today in, in working to improve the area, which brings our public investment to $2,350,000. In 2002, we began seeing private investment in the district, Lyric Theater, as I'm sure you all are aware, um, located to the district, and um, that spurred further interest from private investors. Jeff Struble, Tarina Self, Estrella Evans began purchasing property, doing renovations in the area, and um, we've seen that trend occur up, up till now. Um, our private investment is at $8,854,000. So we're, we're really glad to see the uh, public investment um, um, return on that investment with the private, and so this is just a visual uh, of the uh, increase in private investment, and so we're really glad to see those numbers increase since 2000 and um, moving on from there. We're currently at, uh, um, we're able to see our market district values rise in 2001. The total district values were at a little over a million, and um, we finished up this year with a little over 3.5 million. So that's a 218% increase from 2001, and we're, we're seeing those increase steadily. Uh, we're at a 94% occupancy uh, in the district right now, although I'm not aware of what the occupancy rate was in the district uh, in earlier years, I can assure you it's a, an increase, as well as an increase in the quality of businesses that we have in the district. In 2007, which is right around the time that I came to the district, this is a list of businesses that were viably operating. Anything other than that was uh, vacant, used for storage, um, or under renovation. And so today, 2013, we see uh, an increase of amazing, creative local businesses, diverse, and so these are kind of a visual listing of all of the businesses that we have in the district um, and set to open this year as well. Um, we're, we're also glad to see that those businesses are thriving. Um, these are just some sample retail sales from um, three of our retailers over the last few years. You can see those are increasing every year. And uh, I'm also glad to report there was one shop that just emailed me last night, their figures, and um, they've literally doubled their sales every single year. And uh, they're, they finished out 2012 with $310,000, so that's actually off of this chart. So we're really glad to see those sales increasing, and we can also thank the Oklahoma City Thunder for helping out with those sales and, and Thunder t-shirts and all of the creativity of our local shops in the district. Um, so now for some visual impact. Uh, this is the district in 2001, right before the streetscape was um, put in the district. As you can see, it's not really a place that you'd like to go strolling. Um, so today we have, uh, you know, here, sorry, go back. Uh, these are some of the buildings at that time. We, we have the Velvet Monkey Salon, DNA Galleries, Lyric Theater, some of our shops right there. These were boarded up, again, used for, for storage and vacant. And, um, and then you can see in 2011, we, we had our streetscape put in and people are coming to walk and enjoying the district and, and enjoying 
shopping and, and using that, the streetscape to its best abilities. Can, can you go back a little bit? Sorry. Um, and, and here you see uh, some of the, the buildings under renovation. We've got the Velvet Monkey Salon, the tattoo shop, and we're really glad to see these buildings have come to new uses and they're employing creative professionals and they're attracting a creative audience. So we're really glad to see uh, the creativity and the diverse audiences that these businesses are bringing down to the district. And of course, the Lyric Theater, uh, uh, their renovation in 2000, they opened in 2007, and uh, what they're bringing to the district as far as quality performances of the arts, they're bringing 12,000 people down to the district on an annual basis. And what's really cool is those 12,000 people that they're bringing um, are so different from the 2,000 that the salon is bringing. So it's really awesome to have the, the diverse businesses bringing a diverse audience to the district all the time. And here are just more examples of the visual changes. Um, people out on the street shopping. We've got patios for dining and drinking. So it, it's an amazing transformation. Um, so we've been partnering with the city's commercial district revitalization program for the last few years. And it's been instrumental to our progress. The training and resources that we've received from Kim, Kim Cooper Hart and the planning department has been a huge help for our progress. And I also just want to take this opportunity to commend the city on their efforts and focus on our small commercial districts because they're so vital um, to creating the quality life and, and a unique fabric of Oklahoma City's uh, neighborhoods. So we appreciate your attention and support of our small districts amongst everything else that's happening in Oklahoma City right now. Uh, additionally, we're, we're starting to see the progress of the district impact our surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, this is Class and Ten Pin neighborhood, which has experienced a decline in, in the last few years as, along with the district. Um, so in 2007, we began seeing investment around the outer edge. Uh, Isfahan Gallery, uh, Blue Sage Studios, Art Fusion Studios was uh, an investment in, uh, in a building off Western Avenue, a $275,000 investment, and they're doing great right now in, in a happening art gallery uh, every Friday night. And then we have Sunbeam Family Services, which has purchased property in the district, and they'll be putting uh, their, their home in the neighborhood, and we're, we're glad to have them uh, have, have their home in the neighborhood and serve, serve the families that we have in Class and Ten Pen. And then on the other side of the neighborhood, we also see the 12th and um, Penn Strip Center, the old theater there, has recently been renovated. It has a new restaurant, a hair salon. So we're starting to see the things on the fringe reflect what's happening on the inside of the neighborhood. And we're, we're glad to have been selected along with gate, parts of Gatewood and the Plaza District for the Strong Neighborhoods Initiative. And we're looking forward to seeing the impact that that program will have. Positively, Paseo has begun purchasing homes in the neighborhood. We've all seen the impact that that's had on the Paseo neighborhood, and we're looking forward to, to their impact. They've, they've actually already sold their first house, so we're glad to hear you know, they're selling things. They've only been in the, district, or in the neighborhood for a few months. And then we're seeing families move into the neighborhood and fixing up their houses. One great example of this is Dylan and Amanda Bradway, who have DNA galleries in our district. They were actually living in the back of their store and operating the front for retail and artist-made goods. As their big business grew, they were able to purchase a home in the neighborhood. They've renovated it, and you know that continues their investment and commitment to the area. To the north, we have Gatewood neighborhood, and that that neighborhood had, had not experienced as much decline as Class and Ten Pit. Pin, but we're still seeing progress there. The 18th Street Lofts um, just opened last year and they're at full occupancy. They're amazing modern style lofts just across from Class and SAS School. And um, the Strip Center on 17th and um, Classen has also undergone some facade renovations. So it, additionally, with Gatewood, we're seeing tons of families. Uh, young families, young professionals, and empty nesters, all types of people are moving back into the neighborhood. And we're really glad to see the Plaza District as a hub for these two neighborhoods to, to come together. We see neighbors getting together, having drinks, and hanging out at our events all the time. So we're glad that the dis district is serving as that hub. 
So what's next? There are still, there's still work to be done. So we're going to continue our mission of, promote, of um, developing the district as a place where arts, community, and local business thrives. We're going to continue to do that uh, through promoting the district, encouraging investment, partnering with the city to address the needs, and uh, creating place and opportunity for artists to interact. A quick snapshot of our organization. We've been working since 1997. We have a $110,000 annual budget, 13 board of directors, one and a half staff, and we work with 32 local businesses who represent 1,318 artists. So um, we're really glad to, to serve those artists. Um, in 2011, we finished our five-year strategic plan, and these are the four areas that we're going to work to improve. Organization, marketing, economic development, access, design, and safety. And um, we're going to focus on our organizational expert or our organizational efforts on exploring the creation of a business improvement district and increasing our financial capacity so that we can become a self-sufficient district. We're also going to be restructuring our organization into um, two organizations, a 501c3 that will focus on community programming and the arts, and a 501c6 that will focus on economic development and uh, business improvement district type activities. We're, we'll continue our efforts for marketing, culture, and promotion, and spreading the news and presence about the Plaza District. And our events have been so integral to our success, especially our recent success. And, and they, they bring traffic to the district. They uh, show the potential to investors. And uh, they also provide art experiences for, for the community. So our um, Plaza District Festival uh, is bringing about 4,000 people down on an annual basis. We have over 50 artists that line 16th Street, uh, over 200 performers, and tons of kids' activities. And so we're really glad to see it, glad to offer these opportunities to the neighborhood. Our Live on the Plaza is our second Friday art walk. We're bringing about 1,200 people down to the district on a monthly basis for people to enjoy uh, live music, local art, shopping, and uh, urban life. I, I would have to argue to say it's one of the unique events in Oklahoma City where you can really walk around and feel the energy uh, feel, feel what it's like to walk from a shop to a shop to a restaurant and have lots of happening things happen. It's a great place to come people watch. So it's always been, it's also been integral for our business recruitment. This event really shows the potential of the neighborhood. So we've had a lot of our business come to Alive on the Plaza and, and then decide to open up in the district. So it's been really important to us. We'll also continue our efforts in online communications and social media. That's been uh, imperative for, for growing and spreading the word about the district and also reflecting the personality, our, our local voice, and, and getting an inside look at what's happening in the district. Uh, we're going to continue our efforts in economic and community development, uh, working to um, re recruit investors, working to support the businesses that we, we do have in the district. Um, the businesses that we have are, are really important because we, we're really proud to boast that we have a diverse mix of businesses. Um, we'll just go through these real quick, but we've got artists, we've got um, dance studios, retail, um, dining, artist studios, bars, um, lyric theater, of course, more artists, more studios, and um, they're really bringing uh, a diverse uh, customer base down to the district both day and night. So that's been really important for our development is having the diverse tenants in the area. And um, to do all this work that we've done and to con continue our efforts, we have to build partnerships. And so we're going to continue to work with the neighborhood, churches, schools, other organizations to uh, really build a district that reflects the community that it's around. And in addition to that, uh, we, we have to continue our efforts to improve the physical environment of the district. So we'll work to um, especially work to improve parking, pedestrian access. The district has, has experienced so much traffic in, in recent years that we're starting to see the need for attention to crosswalks and pedestrian safety, parking, and so we'll continue our efforts to um, make it a beautiful, clean, safe, attractive place. So 
Um, with that, I, I'm really glad to, to have the opportunity to, to speak today, and I appreciate, again, your support in making the Plaza District a place that people want to live, work, and play. Are there any questions? I'll just comment, Chris, and I think the Plaza District has probably come as, as, as far as fast as about any district we've had. It's, it's an amazing turnaround. I drove through yesterday showing, showing off the city as I typically do to outside visitors, and I always take them through the Plaza District because it's, it's unique. Um, it, 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 it provides, I think, a glimpse into uh, to, the, to the culture of Oklahoma City that we want to offer. And uh, if it weren't for the Plaza District, we'd be trying to create the Plaza District. So thank you for Absolutely. jumping ahead on us. Uh, Meg mayor, and then Ed. Yeah, if I could. I, Kristen, uh, you've used the word amazing. I heard the mayor just use it as well. And it's so true. Uh, this is an absolutely amazing transformation. And I can't believe it's been only five years I know. Uh, since you've been there. It may feel to you like it's been a lot longer than that. But you've done an, uh, um, just an absolutely incredible job um, and really recognize, I think, the link and the important connection between the commercial district and the neighborhoods. And it's so important for you to point out that we're now beginning to see um, improvement in the surrounding neighborhoods that mm -hmm. I think are direct, directly reflective of what happened in the Plaza District. So, um, you know, this is a model that I hope we can continue to use. And something that you didn't talk about that I'd like to kind of um, applaud you for is how you're taking your knowledge and, and you and some of your board members and your retailers taking what you've learned here and really reaching out to the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. And the Better Block um, initiative is one that I think is incredibly important. I think this group may remember last year we had a, a trial um, weekend over at uh, 7th and Hudson, which kind of highlighted some of the really interesting opportunities in urban planning and development. And uh, this year they're taking their message to the um, farmer's market, which uh, you know, is just ripe for this same kind of development. And it, you know, it's an area that needs your energy and, and your knowledge. Um, I was just talking with Councilman Kelly. Um, there are lots of areas over in the northeast part of town that I think have this same opportunity. And if you will allow us to tap into your knowledge and experience, um, along with Kim and our planning department, as we kind of move this concept around, you're seeing the spark of it happen on 23rd Street. You're, you know, we're, we're really seeing that the community, I think, is ripe. Um, Capitol Hill should be our next um, amazing, I hate to overuse the word, but amazing opportunity. So thank you so much for, for using the Plaza District almost as a laboratory to, to show what can happen yeah, when the absolutely. neighborhood gets together and, and the business owners get together to improve their own district. So very much appreciate it. Absolutely. Ed. I want to echo those and then just follow up on what Meg's asking. I mean, you have created a a unique sense of place and a unique pedestrian experience. Um, it seems like it started off with the streetscape. And so, as Meg was pointing out, there's different uh, districts that are looking with some jealousy and looking to the Plaza District for guidance. In my, uh, in my ward, 39th Street or Western is now studying their corridor and, and, and looking at the Plaza District. What, do you have any any thoughts in terms of streetscapes? I mean, what, what seemed to start this off of what worked for you, what didn't work? I mean, there's not enough money to do everything. So mm -hmm. if you had to prioritize, what in the streetscape seemed to be the most important? What if you could do it different, would you have added or not put in there? Yeah, um, I wasn't around when they did the streetscape and when they were planning that. I will say, I do feel it's extremely important. The streetscape was the first visual change for the district. It's when people noticed that something was happening and that's what drew investors, that's what drew people to, to know that something was about to change there. So I, I, I do feel that it's very important and, and I do know that there's not all the money in the world to fix every street. Um, but what worked, I think what was done well with ours, it was one of, the, I don't know if it was the first one, but it was one of the first ones um, done. and. The wide plazas, the wide streets that they created have really allowed us to um, infill activity, especially for our events. So putting up an outdoor artist market, popping up a hot dog cart. When there's a boarded up window, you can throw something on the side of the street there to fill in and fill in that energy. And, and someone probably doesn't notice the boarded up window. They notice the hot dog vendor or they notice the artist market. So I think it was really important to put the pedestrian first in the streetscape, 
the amount of space for walking and activity on ours was was really important. Um, what what would be done differently? Uh, green space. We don't have very much shade. We don't have very much green space in the district at all. It kind of feels like a big con vast concrete area. So I would have put in more uh, places for green greenery. Yeah, I agree with you on the wide. I, I assume you had to take significant parking to get that. Yes, uh, and significant. And they weren't happy at the time. <laughs> right, but it turned out turned out okay, more than okay. Yeah, I mean we're we're back to parking issues now, but um, it, I wouldn't trade parking there for for not having the streetscape. Do, do you have any thoughts about maybe integrating transit about making uh, shelters that the district has? say in or design in or a way to get people into the into the district without using cars yeah I, i'd love in the future to tap into what's going on with the street car downtown even finding a way to move people from the edge of midtown to the district whether that be bus i mean there's various ways that that could be done but i, I definitely think there's going to be a push to see the plaza district ocu 23rd street uh in in the routes, uh, whatever public transit way that means. I mean, repurposing trolleys for the trolley neighborhoods or um, or a street car, street car in the long run, but we definitely think that, we definitely think the district will be in a good place for tourism in the next <laughs> few years as well. So we'd like to be able to get people who are in town who don't have a car to the district. Thank you. Kristen, thanks very much. Could I, if I could just make one other comment, I think the other thing that was critical to that streetscape, and it has been to, Automobile Alley and the others is lighting. Yes. Uh, you know, That's when you true. drive along 16th Street and hit the Plaza District with those street lights, you automatically know where you are and it created a, a safe sense of place right away. So that would be the other big component. Kristen, thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other city manager reports? No, be happy to answer any questions. All right. No one has signed up as citizens to be heard. Have I missed anybody? All right. Ready to adjourn? We're adjourned.